The Health Care Access Fund was established in 1992 to pay for Minnesota care, but more recently has also been used to pay for medical assistance and in 2017, a reinsurance program to help stabilize health insurance rates in the individual market. The tax that funds the account is set to expire at the end of 2019. Senator Tony Lorre, the ranking minority member of the Health and Human Services Committee, joins me to talk more about this. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Glad to be joining you, Shannon. The critics of the Health Care Access Fund, have, which lobbies a 2% tax on yep. hospitals and health care providers, have called it a hidden tax, a sick tax, or even a regressive tax because it passes uh, those fees along to those people who need the services. Is that a fair criticism of this tax? Well, I mean, in, in, a, in an ideal world, um, a more uh, general tax would be preferable. The, the real rub is that we don't live in an ideal world. We live in this one. And the fact of the matter is, you know, Minnesota has a really high ranking on our health statistics in, in regard to the rest of the country consistently. And it's not by accident, it's by design. And it, it comes from our willingness to dedicate uh, resources to the health of our people and our communities. Key among those resources that we've dedicated um, to the health of our population is the health care access fund primarily funded by the provider tax. Um, you know, if you look at where other states have failed, it's that, that their investments in the health of their populations are in competition with everything else that the state uh, tries to accomplish. And, and they come up on the short end of the stick consistently. And so, you know, uh, fair in a, in a sense, yes, but in another sense, we're able to, to raise those revenues and invest them in the health of our populations and achieve uh, statistics that, that, that go beyond our health care system. Our health status benefits our entire economy broadly. It benefits our educational system because our kids show up more ready to learn. It, it, uh, it benefits our economy in a much more broad sense because our workforce is amongst the most, the healthiest and the most productive in the country. It, it, it pays dividends across all of the sectors of our economy. And, I, you know, it'd be nice if, if somebody could figure out how to really dedicate a more general tax, but nobody's cracked that nut. Well, when you consider that when it was created, it was to fund Minnesota Care, which mm -hmm. provided insurance for people who made too much money for medical assistance, but not enough yep. money for their own insurance. Now, I think 97% of that is now paid through federal dollars, which leaves this pool of money, which has been used for medical assistance and to pay for reinsurance in 2017. Right. So it's not being used as it was initially directed to be used. So wouldn't it make sense then to let it sunset and go back to the general fund, which is how medical assistance used to be funded primarily anyway? Sure, I get your point. But if you follow the population that this was intended to serve, the population has transferred over to medical assistance with still a state um, support required. And so when we, follow, when we allow those investments to follow the population, it makes sense to, to transfer some of those costs from the health care access fund into the medical assistance pool. And it also funds, I should, I should say, um, our, our biggest investment in public health that we have, our statewide health improvement uh, program is completely funded out of the health care access fund, as are many of our education and research uh, dollars come from the health care access fund as well. If we allow the provider tax to expire, we lose that ability to support the population that was served by Minnesota Care. That was the original intent. And also those public health, those really critical workforce and public health dollars will go away as well. Are you afraid that, because presumably then those dollars would come from the general fund, that, that those programs that, that you're speaking of wouldn't be able to compete with all of the other demands on the general fund? Well, particularly when there isn't a replacement to actually increase the general fund to accommodate this spending. I mean, the spending is occurring. You know, I mean, I've been balancing the health and human services spreadsheet for long enough to know that it doesn't really matter who has the election certificates if you take this spreadsheet and you erase $1.4 billion over a biennial period from the middle of that spreadsheet, we are not going to be able to keep the promises that we've collectively, Democrats and Republicans, made to the people of Minnesota. So if this expires, there is, uh, the Star Tribune called it a fiscal cliff that the state is looking at because I read 500 million, you told me before we began that it's closer to $700 million that will be missing. So if that happens, if it expires, what what's the legislature going to do? What what should be done? 
Well, that's, that's a real question. And truthfully, most of the opponents to the provider tax actually do realize that we, we can't survive in health and human services just allowing that complete loss of revenue. So the, the MMA, who has a long history of, of preferring the Minnesota, a, Medical Minnesota Medical Association, the largest uh, group uh, uh, representing doctors, um, has uh, been commissioning a study trying to see what other options we could come up with to try to raise revenue. I mean, I think everybody pretty broadly understands we can't just allow that cliff to occur. I, you know, um, I, the solutions are draconian cuts. I mean, becoming a Mississippi, that's not, that's just not acceptable. We're, we're, we're Minnesota. We're going we're gonna to meet the needs of our people. One other aspect to this is the reinsurance program, which was passed largely by Republicans in 2017. Yep. Governor Dayton allowed it to become law without his signature. It was a two-year program to stabilize rates in the individual market, which it has been credited with doing. But that funding also came from the Health Care Access Fund. So there's there's sort of a double cliff then yep. because that, that money is going away and also that reinsurance program will cease existing. So do you have some thoughts on what the legislature could do to address that? Well, I, I do. I mean, the reinsurance program was a, a, a real um, subsidy for insurance companies. And I think that we could much better target the individuals that are really um, in need of support. I, you know, I've been working uh, in a bipartisan manner with the Senator Jensen, I actually chief authored, and I was a co-author of a state-based tax credit in, that would replace the reinsurance and could much better target just those individuals that that um, really do have affordability out of their re reach on the individual market. The reinsurance buys down, you know, the, the price point of premiums, but for everybody under 400% of federal poverty level, the advanced premium tax credits already bought those down. And, and our work is, you know, actually just sort of overlapping that and not really helping everybody. Um, and there are still people very, very much priced out of the marketplace once you reach the 400 percent. Imagine the independent business couple or the farm couple in southeastern Minnesota where they're 60 years old, they're not yet on Medicare. Um, the age rating factor, the three to one factor, um, as you approach Medicare, insurance companies can charge uh, mm -hmm. elder, older people three times as much as younger people. So it's people. very expensive for them. $66,000 for a couple, you're over 400 percent of federal poverty level, you are no longer eligible for subsidies, your premiums can reach $30,000 a year. Premiums. I, you know, and, and that's after the effect of reinsurance. We, that's a small number of people that with a much more targeted and more generous um, state-based tax credit, we could really address them in a more meaningful way. And um, if it, some people may remember uh, the feds really threw us a curveball in the approval of our waiver to, to get the reinsurance um, approved, and they held us harmless on the qualified health plan side. But they also made us lose uh, $90 million of federal money per year in support of our Minnesota care. Um, that's a real problem. I mean, that's, that's real money. And, and, you know, taking another look at that, we could probably restore the federal flow to support Minnesota care, uh, better target and, and reach the individuals that are still struggling and affordability is out of their reach for the products that are on the market now. So there are some additional options, but they will take resources as well. Um, and so that brings me to the dedicated tax yep. question because this essentially has been a dedicated tax for healthcare purposes that has been funded or passed through whatever by a specific group of people. If it goes to the general fund, is and, and taxes just increase? I mean, is that an option? Not really, because the you know in time in, uh, uh, economies are cyclical, mm -hmm. and when people are most in need is when our general fund is going to be most stressed, mm -hmm. and and so the the counter cyclical nature of health and human service needs really works against you and you will lose over time. And that's what every other state's experience has demonstrated clearly. So I'm not gonna argue against the, again, the ideal world having a more general tax that is able to be structured in a less regressive manner would be preferable. But again, we don't live in the ideal world, we live in this one. Uh, Minnesota's investments, uh, you know, I believe pay tremendous dividends and it's something 
I'm proud to, you know, uh, stand up and support and, you know, uh, uh, take the criticisms, you know, listen to them. I, I'll work with the folks who come forward after the, the study that they've commissioned and see if there are some additional options. But I really do think that we do need a dedicated funding stream to make sure that we don't lose our focus on the health of our populations and our people. Senator Laurie, I want to thank you so much. You bet. Always a pleasure.